It's my great uh, privilege and honor and pleasure to uh, welcome and introduce Professor Nigel Mason. Uh, with whom we have a very long collaborative relations and uh, uh, he has been a very kind person to our group and uh, many people. Professor Mason as, uh, is actually known to the Eisen body. All of us know him quite well because he is, his presence is always uh, remarkable in all the conferences, many conferences actually and camps uh, basically. But formally I take uh, this opportunity to introduce him. Professor Mason currently working as head of uh, School of Physical Sciences at the University of Kent, UK, uh, has a very long career in various fields, uh, which are primarily touching the atomic and molecular physics and the peripheral fields. Uh, uh, he is uh, he, he describes himself as an enthusiastic, optimistic, and strategic person. And as we have all witnessed uh, over many years, that the, he is absolutely uh, uh, optimistic, uh, absolutely enthusiastic, and he actually energizes the youngsters, the uh, young buddy uh, scientists, uh, all over, wherever he goes in conferences and whenever we meet him, we are always encouraged. So the uh, research fields that, as I said, uh, of Professor Mason has been always in the peripheral of atomic and molecular physics, but primarily he, is, he, is, he has an expertise in many other fields. Uh, touching uh, the AMOP, atmospheric chemistry, astrochemistry, and planetary science, plasma physics, nanotechnology, radiation chemistry, uh, and uh, recently cancer radiotherapy and uh, uh, other fields. So uh, he has published more than uh, 250 research papers and his H index is in excess of 30. And he has been a very uh, highly cited and quoted scientist uh, in the uh, fields uh, in uh, that I just mentioned. Uh, personally speaking, I have a very uh, an, an honor and pleasure to have interacted with him. Like many of us, uh, uh, he has been uh, very very encouraging, and uh, his talks, he's he always gives a very sparkling deliveries uh, at various platforms. And today also is one of those days uh, when uh, we uh, uh, have uh, the opportunity to hear Professor Mason. And while we mourn uh, the sad demise of uh, uh, Professor Mason's mother, uh, uh, we, I formally welcome Professor Mason to the uh, Indian Society of Atomic and Molecular Physics to deliver uh, a very nice uh, speech. Thank you very much, Professor Mason. Thank you very much, Nigel. Thank you. I just hope everybody can hear me. Can everybody see the slides? Thumbs up? Yes. Yep. Okay, so thank you for the invitation. Um, Yes, I, I do apologize. Um, sadly, my mother passed away yesterday. Uh, so I was hoping to spend yesterday um, just editing the talk a little bit. So there's probably more slides than I anticipated on giving. So I'll either go fast or go over one or two of them. And then, uh, but, but you can have the slides afterwards and so on as well. Um, I'll start with some shameless self-publicity. Um, this uh, talk is based on two books. Uh, the one on the left, Atomic Molecular Ionization by Electron Scattering, where the person, my very good colleague, Professor Joshi Pua from India. Uh, this book um, basically is also a data manual for all the data that we had on uh, electron impact uh, of many, many mo molecules, but it also has quite a few um, discussions about applications. The book on the right is a compendium put together by several of the leading people in the field, um, many of the people you will know. Um, on low energy electrons. Uh, it was edited by Otto Ingelsen, professor in Iceland. Um, but there are many people who you would know in that, Peter Schrederick uh, from Bremen, David Field and I wrote one of the chapters on electrons in space. Um, so as I say, these are, these are two books if, 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 if you want to follow up. So what I'm gonna do is take you through a little bit of um, a process of where electrons play a key role and then just pick out a few highlighted things. Some of them you may have seen before if you've been to some lectures of mine in the last two or three years, but there are some new things always happening all the time. And then right at the end, I'm just gonna talk about two areas of research that, that we've just started. Um, I should say they were just about to start in March and then we got hit by COVID. So the meetings and everything we had planned um, have now been postponed until 2021, but I'll just talk a little bit. And they focus on two app new applications of electron collisions. One is the study of flames and combustion and the other is related to space and building a rocket um, next generation of um, 
rocket thrusters using uh, electron-induced plasmas. So um, very quickly, uh, I'll just go through the sort of highlighted topics and then go into some detail. Um, atmospheric and planetary atmospheres is, is very topical. Um, this is a famous picture of the northern aurora. Um, again, my colleague in Iceland sees these most of the winter. We now know that aurora are actually apparent on many other planets. Uh, we're particularly interested in the ones in Jupiter. Jupiter has a strong aurora system and we're going to Jupiter with a space mission called uh, um, ah, Wayne's just gone there, uh, <laughs> a juice um, in about three or four years time. So um, all these things are linked to the fact that electrons can induce chemistry. I'll come back to talk about that in a moment. The picture on the left here is that of Titan. Um, it was probably the most famous uh, planetary mission in the last 20 years. Um, we've got a lot of information we're still analyzing from that, uh, very related to electron collision physics, very much related to dissociated electron attachment, which uh, Professor Ku e. K. Ku talked about last week. And on the right is the role of electrons in space. And I'll come back to that because we've got some rather exciting examples on that. Electron-induced processing, though, is, is, is very important in industry. And we've had now for about 20 or 30 years a running program, particularly with Japan, looking at the uh, semiconductor plasmas, uh, manufacturing of computer chips. Uh, that is still continuing. In fact, there was a webinar series every Monday um, at, not at 10 o'clock UK time, uh, similar time to this, uh, where the uh, European and the Japanese communities meet to discuss um, uh, the next generation of uh, semiconductor processing. Um, and again, people are welcome. If anybody's interested and wants to join in on that, I'm, I'm happy to pass on. In the last two decades, of course, electron-induced processing has been very strongly focused on the, the effects of uh, electrons on tissues and DNA, uh, the uh, role of uh, secondary electrons. So we have some ionizing phenomena, maybe an iron beam, maybe a UV, maybe uh, some proton therapy produces a secondary avalanche of electrons, which then interact with the DNA. And these are the famous experiments by Leon Sange, which I'll come back to. But I'll show you here about how we're now taking that on. We've, we're moving on from actually doing experiments on these molecules to actually going into the clinic. And I'll show you some of the examples. Uh, Chetan mentioned that we're that nanotechnology, surface engineering. Um, the experiments were done now about two decades ago of using uh, STMs uh, to, to manipulate molecules on surfaces. Uh, that work is now developing um, in new ways. Um, people are now trying to, to, to gear these up um, and make these into maybe a potentially a more commercial application. And we'll talk about on that. So often I'm going to talk about a mixture of what electrons can do and what about electron-induced chemistry. Again, he came here and talked about this last week, but I mean, I think it's quite easy just to, just to summarize in one slide what I mean by electron-induced chemistry. So what I mean by electron-induced chemistry is the incoming electron, usually a low energy electron, collides with the molecule, excites it in some way, and then that molecule dissociates. And this is electron-induced dissociation. Um, and we then end up with some fragments. And some of, well, some of those fragments might be a radical fragment, R, which can subsequently react with other molecules in the local media. Could be a liquid, could be a solid, could be hard pressure gas to produce some further chemical species. And that's what I mean by electron-induced chemistry. This is now a field that um, has been developed again over probably the last two decades. Many people in India have been critically involved in that, particularly in the TIFR, but um, others as well. Um, that work's continuing and, and, and momentum is growing. Um, these things always take time, but you'll see some examples of that. So the electron engine processes I'm particularly interested in are the ones that actually lead to that dissociation. And we have four processes that we're interested in. The direct dissociation, where we just break up the molecule and we end up with some fragments. One of those fragments might be ionized. That might, that's called dissociative ionization. I really probably don't need to tell this community about the next one, dissociative electron attachment. I'm sure EK gave a good summary of that last week. Um, a process that 20 years ago was perhaps in the, in the backwaters, but now is absolutely essential. We find it so important everywhere, in, for example, the atmosphere of Titan. And then there's a last one, dipolar dissociation, um, where we break up the molecule and we produce two ionic fragments, one positive, one negative. Um, I think I've said this in several Indian meetings and talked this over with Dainandi uh, there. That's a process we still don't know enough about. 
Uh, we're still not studying it in sufficient detail. We keep saying we should do more on it, um, but we don't. But I, I think we need to do. The interesting thing for many of you who are theoretic theoreticians is that many of these processes are very hard to model theoretically. Uh, we can do direct ionization, read the book by myself and Joshi Pura, but actually trying to even just trying to do calculations of a dissociative ionization and what the different association channels are and actually to model those is very difficult. Uh, we don't have it. Um, we're going into continuum problems on theory and that still needs quite a lot. And even the electron attachment uh, processing um, is still quite a challenge. Uh, we are trying to do some calculations um, with Quantimol, again, a code that many are using in India with Johnson Tennyson uh, developed. We're trying to extend that into bigger molecules. And uh, one of my current PhD students has been testing quantum mole to its limits with some really big molecules. You'll see some of them later. I don't think the results um, are, are necessarily terribly uh, reliable. They don't agree with some of the experiments which we're doing. And that just tells you that as you get into really big molecules, we're still struggling to do these theoretically. But the amount of data we need for all the applications I'm gonna show you is so huge that we can't possibly, even if we mobilize the entire manpower resources of India to do it, it probably still wouldn't give us all the data we need in a reasonable time. So as I said, I'm just gonna give you some examples um, and uh, pull out some examples of work that's currently ongoing. The first one um, is ice processing and molecular synthesis in space. Now to date, um, it is still true to say that if I look in space and I find these huge regions of, of which look dark, they're not dark, they're only dark because those regions have dust in them and the dust precludes the light from coming through. These dust is these small grains that are normally either a carbon or a silicate core covered with some icy mantle and we irradiate that mantle and we make molecules and it is those molecules that then go down to, to make the in the plant formation processes may be the precursors of the prebiotic chemistry we need for life. To date, uh, most experiments have tended to focus on uh, light absorb uh, experiments uh, radiating with, with light. We know, however, that they're radiated by cosmic rays. We know, therefore, that either whether we, heat the, we use UV light or we use cosmic rays, we induce a huge number of secondary electrons. And it's these secondary electrons that we think drive much of the processes. Uh, of those of those icy mantles. Um, we now have a European-wide program, this is a bit of Europlanet, where we try and do all these experiments uh, in a uniform way. So we, we, do, we, we make some icy layers, we irradiate them with ultraviolet light on synchrotrons, we heat them in temperature program desorption experiments and analyze things that come off of quadrupole mass spectrometry. We now have very nice iron beam facilities. I know you have iron beam facilities in India. We are have two or three in the Europe, uh, Caen, but now one in, in Debrecen, in uh, Hungary, where we're doing iron beam irradiation experiments. Actually, my, my day started with my daily meeting with the team to talk about proton bombardment and sulfur ion bombardment of, of uh, icy mantles um, and what we're seeing. However, we have to do all those experiments also with electrons because if the secondary electrons are producing the main effect, we need to compare the ion beam irradiation with that. So we know really that although we, we fire in our ion beams, um, we essentially are producing a lot of secondary electrons. And, it's, and so we need to, to, as I say, repeat all those experiments with electrons. Um, but we can make some complicated molecules. We can make really large sort of molecules, which are kind of prebiotic molecules like glycine. The experimental program is, is very simple. We have a series of these apparatus. The one on the left is one that's very well known to, to, to uh, Barlas of Ironman. He did his PhD on this. It's still going. Uh, um, we use it a lot. Very simple, um, very similar to the experiments he has in PRL. It's a cryostat which we can use to cool down a substrate on which we deposit the ices. We then irradiate those ices with whatever medium we want, electrons, photons, ions, and we analyze them predominantly with the infrared radiation, although now we are also using a terahertz uh, spectroscopy uh, in, in Holland. The experiment on the right is a large chamber, which is, which is now essentially in, in Nijmegen, um, where we're using the, that chamber to look at the terahertz spectroscopy of the ices that we make, because it gives us more information on the, on the products. Um, very similar again to the experiment that Barlow's been building up um, in PRL. Yeah, but we haven't got a terahertz laser in the UK, we have to go to Holland, so 
some of you have seen this before, but I just want to give you, this is, this is a classic one. I'll just show you it because although we did this some time ago, uh, this is our standard and we are repeating it even as we speak now. We use this as our kind of template for all the experiments. This is a very simplized mixture. It's about the simplest one you can have, uh, water and carbon dioxide ice. You put your ice layer down. We typically get down to about uh, 18 or 20 Kelvin. I think this one was taken a few years ago and it's probably at about uh, 20, 22 Kelvin. Um, you measure the infrared spectrum. Um, you'll see the peaks there due to water and carbon dioxide. You irradiate it then for an hour. All experiments typically are an hour. Um, it's about the patience of a PhD student. Um, and we irradiate them and we, we, we analyze as we're going along what we make. Um, you get the green curve. The sort of species you'd expect to make is you break up your CO2 to make CO. You've got an oxygen left over, so you can make CO3. CO3 can dissolve in the water and you make carbonic acid. You can then warm the ice up. As you warm the ice up, the CO2 and the water disappear. You do see some phase changes, so you can see the change in the crystallinity of the ice. You can see at a particular temperature the water moves from amorphous to crystalline. But you keep heating and at the end you end up with the residue, which we call it. And this is the carbonic acid. And this is exactly what we're seeing on Mars. We now actually have instruments looking at the Martian ice cap in the summer, where the ice cap retreats, and then you're left with this carbonic acid that basically then eats into the rocks. Now this is an absolute classic sort of astrochemistry, planetary science experiment. Um, if you then change your projectile, and you start to think about, okay, let's not use electrons, let's use a photon, or let's use something more complicated. Uh, what do you make? Do you make the same things? Um, JUICE is the European mission to the icy moons of Jupiter. Uh, there, one of the important ions is sulfur ions, sulfur ions because they come from Io. So we're now doing these experiments as we speak uh, with uh, photons and with sulfur ions uh, to see if we get the same effects or what other new molecules that we make and that's essential because that's what we think we will be looking for when juice flies there um, in the in, in next decade. Now I can't give this talk without mentioning Rosetta, the uh, European mission to a comet, partly because uh, at the Open University, the Open University built one of the mass spectrometry landers uh, which actually landed on the comet. Now, why we got so excited about the about the Rosetta was not the fact that we actually could find the molecules, but it actually is the first uh, experiment that actually shows the importance of electrons. We've always been trying to find something in space that will actually say to us, that is due to electrons. That's not due to photons or ions. This is actually an electron-driven process. Now, Dennis Bodovitz, um, who, who led some of this work, um, very good example. He did his PhD uh, in uh, Groningen um, with um, uh, um, oh, what's his name? Um, ah, brains has gone to sleep again. Sorry, didn't sleep much last night. Uh, he uh, anyway, he did his PhD there. He then went over to the states, joined NASA, um, and was involved in the Rosetta mission. What they did is they looked at the emission spectrum of, of plumes coming out from the comet at different distances as it got closer to the sun. And what they discovered in the ultraviolet was when they tried to fit the spectrum that they were getting with photon-induced data, they couldn't get it to fit. They, 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 there was no way they could get it to fit. But what happened was uh, that when they put in electron-induced association, it fits. So what's happening is that the Alice UV spectrometer studied the water and carbon dioxide gas coming off from the surface. These molecules are broken up by the photons, UV photons, that then the secondary electrons lead to further emissions. And most particularly, they, they, they react with the molecules that give CN, the strong violet line in the previous one. The violet line there, you can see on the cursor works, these ones here are due to nitrogen containing species being disrupted by the electrons and producing CM. If they did not put in electron induced dissociation and electron induced excitation cross sections, the data does not fit. So they're absolutely no, but this is the first time that we've got a clear example of electron induced processing in a planetary object. And that's very exciting. And we're getting ready for another comet mission, which is called Comet Interceptor in the Europe. 
where the plan is that we will launch a satellite, it will sit in the one for Lagrangian orbit, it will wait until an interesting comet comes by and then it will be sent off to look for it. Again, some of you may have read in the literature that there have now been some evidence of comets coming into our solar system from outside. Um, and ideally what we would do is go and rendezvous with one of them. Um, but we don't know what comets are going to come, so we have to just launch and wait. Um, but one of the things that we'll be looking for on that is the information we get on the electron-induced chemistry that actually occurs. So this is the first evidence that we had of an electron-driven process in a space environment that clearly can only work by understanding electron-induced physics. It couples ultraviolet and electron-induced processing and it produces molecular synthesis. And these are the molecules that are claimed to have been detected by Rosetta. Um, there's a bit of a debate. There are two instruments. They each show slightly different molecules. So there's a little bit of debate about whether we really have seen all these molecules. But you can see they're the very rich inventory of these molecules that we have. And some of those we believe are only going to be up uh, if um, we actually understand the electron induced processing in these cometary environments. So uh, an exciting thing. The question then is, is, is having made these, the, the, all these molecules, could those molecules themselves then start to react and combine to make the building blocks of life, the amino acids and the sugars? And so the question is, well, if you irradiate these mantles, can you, can you make something even richer? And these are again, some experiments that, that, that have been done the, uh, in, in some recent theses, where we, for instance, look at the formation of formaldehyde from the irradiation of ammonia and methanol ice. Very easy to make a residue of formaldehyde, formal, formamide, sorry, formamide and formaldehyde. Formamide are essential in the kind of prebiotic chemistry. Um, if some of you are working with large laser facilities, um, the large laser facility in Prague um, has been using um, high intensity um, laser beams to dump energy into these ices um, to produce uh, a plasma, if you like. And they have discovered that they can readily make these molecules in that way as well. And they claim that this is a, a mimic of impact studies. But with Bala and the people in PRL, we're not using lasers to do impact studies, we're doing shock studies with shock tubes. But all these things show that if you put energy into these systems, you produce these molecules. So if we take a methylamine and CO2 and we radiate it, we make glycine. Um, Okay, so, so let's, let's go on. One of the key processes that may well be important in these is what EK probably talked about last week, well I know he talked about it last week but unfortunately I couldn't hear it, um, is this dissociative electron attachment. And why this is interesting for us is because it, it means that we can use chemistry at energy, at very low energies. And the, we know many environments where the electrons are thermalizing and therefore we have a lot of low energy electrons. And again, until, EK and the started to, 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 to do the, the famous BMI experiments, velocity map imaging experiments, um, we started to actually explain to other people in other communities that you can actually do chemistry with very low energy electrons, you don't need the energy of the electron to be above the dissociation energy. Um, people really didn't understand this process. But as we go into it more and more, we realize that dissociative electron attachment um, is needed. This is the classic first experiment done by Eugen Nuremberger on the molecule CF3Cl. It just shows this resonant processes that, that, the, that the yields are resonant. You get the fragments over certain energy ranges. And that if you shine your electrons in low energy, i.e. about zero, you break the carbon chlorine bond and you get uh, Cl minus. If you fire it in at slightly higher energies, you break the carbon fluorine bond, the cleavage, and you get the higher ones. So this is the process of dissociative electron attachment. This is a picture which you will have seen many times, not least because it's one of EKs, to show those processes. Once you've made those negative ion fragments, then you can actually uh, get those fragments to react by ion molecule reactions or anything else, and you can produce new species. So, um, and you can do that in clusters as well as in a surface. So clusters are also very interesting at the moment because cluster chemistry is, is, is becoming important in studying the aerosols of Titan, but it's also, as we will see later, absolutely essential when we're studying flames. Uh, flames are atmospheric pressure process. If you're studying pressure, atmospheric pressure processes in the lab and you're studying flames, most of your molecules are in clusters, often clustered with water clusters, 
and these internal chemistry inside the clusters driven by electron induced attachment may well be very important. Okay. And you can transfer your surface as well. So you can lay down your molecules on the surface, irradiate them, liberate some species and make the chemistry happen. And Petra Schrederick and the team in Bremen are, are working on this. But really the process that's coming up to being used now is for electron induced lithography. So we've been looking for ways to, to make new types of nanostructure. We've looked about trying to do surface functionalization, changing the properties of matter using electrons. Why electrons? Because they're cheap. It's very easy to make a low energy electron beam. You just need a filament and a battery. You don't need large lasers to do um, laser induced chemistry and so on. You can just do it with electrons. It can also use plasmas because they've got lots of electrons in them. So this work has been developed if you really want high power control, if you actually want to do, choose where on the surface you want the chemistry to happen, rather than have a plasma across the whole surface, why don't you try and use a, a, a tip to determine what you want to do? And that's the work that was developed under scanning tunneling microscopy. Now SDM uh, is just basically a very bright electron source. Uh, and if you put your electron tip over your molecule and you pass your electrons from the tip through the molecule, you're going to get electron induced chemistry. However, it does take place in very high electric fields because there's a big field gradient for it to occur. And you have got it all on the surface and you've got to take into account the properties of the surface. You may have to take in what they call image potentials and so on. Now, again, some of you will have heard of the name Richard Palmer, Richard Palmer in the UK and Peter Sloan, they kind of pioneered some of this work. Richard has now moved on to other things, but Peter in Bath is still kind of doing these experiments. But the problem is, how do you scale those up in industry? Um, okay. Now, our real problem of what we're trying to do is to say, okay, we want to use these techniques to make smaller and smaller features. Now, this is a famous picture showing um, the situation uh, about two or three years ago, where basically the traditional methods of making smaller and smaller chips by basically plasma processing is running out. We, we, we can't get them much smaller. We, we're down to trying to get to sub 30 nanometer structures. If we want to go to sub 10 nanometer structures, plasma processing is not really working. So we had to come up with some new methods and these new methods are called focused electron and ion beam deposition. So this is what it basically is. You take an electron beam, a very high energy electron beam, um, like you have in an electron microscope or an ion beam. So it's very well focused and you fire it onto your surface and you uh, induce the chemistry in the surface by these beams. But actually you do, don't quite do it like that because what you actually do is you deposit at the same time as you irradiate. So that's a bit more complicated because what you're doing is you've got your molecules, you've got some gas phase chemistry where the, electro, where the gas molecules are interacting with this high energy electron beam above the surface and you've got the chemistry in the surface. And the chemistry on the surface is constantly changing as the molecules build up. So it's quite a complicated process, but the idea is that essentially this high energy primary electron beams coming in, it's hitting the surface, it's producing a load of secondary electrons, and those secondary electrons are interacting with the molecules on the surface, and also maybe backscattered out into the gas beam. So it's a real, dynamical process that you have to study. So what happens when you do that? So this is, again, we can look at very complicated molecules and some of you will know about some of the molecules that are being used to do this. They're quite large molecules. They're examples like iron surrounded by carbon monoxide molecules, but they're too complicated to model and they're often too complicated really to understand what's going on. We don't have enough of the uh, dynamics. So we've tried to go back and do something simpler and we started with one which happens to also work in astrochemistry. It's basically methanol and ammonia and a one-to-one -one mixture. So we put these two molecules together and we fire electron beam in at the same time. They're depositing on a zinc selenide substrate rather than a metal substrate. That's purely because we can then fire an infrared beam through the zinc selenide substrate and see what's building up. Really we should do it on a metal substrate but when we tried the amount of reflection signal we got back from the FTIR wasn't sufficient for us to actually see the chemistry. So we went back to, to transmission. Here's a nice picture of it. You've got the three molecules there. At the bottom, you've got the pure ammonia ice. In the middle, you've got the plain 
um, a methanol ice, and the top you've got the two mixed together. You then <clears throat> look at them and you do the irradiation. And you can do it two ways. You can just irradiate the ice, or you can irradiate the ice at the same time as you're depositing the ice. And what you will see in these two pictures in the red one is just the irradiation of the ice. And we see what we expected to see. We see some CO2 um, coming from the, from the methanol. We see some uh, H2CO, we see some methane. When we do the simultaneous irradiation, we get a new peak. We got OCN, which we don't see, from just irradiating on the surface. So again, the bottom one here shows the CO peak. The top one shows that we get different species when we're irradiating as we deposit. Um, so we see different chemistry depending on whether the molecules are just frozen out on the surface or whether we're reacting with them in the gas phase and then some radicals or something's being made in the gas phase and reacting with the surface. So quite different chemistries occurring depending on whether we irradiate the frozen out layer or we irradiate at the same time as we're depositing. We make different molecules. I won't go into great details, but this is, it just shows you a difference of say even the yields of carbon monoxide change. So you can see here, the carbon monoxide yield is, 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 is peaks when earlier when we're depositing. It's, it's, it's a slightly different shape when we do ice film. Here are just some of the molecules that you see the differences. These are some concentration ratios that we measure in the column densities. There, you can just see there are differences in some molecules we make there. But this is important because this is how focused electron ion do de de deposition works. It, it works by this gas, gaseous and surface reactions happening at the same time. So th although this is not directly applicable to FEBIB, it proves that what we're doing in FEBIB is likely to be doing something similar. And that's that's makes it really trying to understand how the chemistry of building the nanostructures using focused electron beams is difficult. So really the chemistry in the simultaneous deposition is richer and more diverse than just the direct surface radiation. We believe it's driven by radicals, which we make in the gas phase, and they're more active in the gas phase in the surface because those radicals are more free to move in the radicals produced in the surface might be less mobile, less labile. But the problem is you can't predict what you're going to happen. So you can't be too confident about assuming you know what the result's going to be. Don't get cocky. So, you know, it's the famous picture of Bush saying the Gulf War was over, mission accomplished. Uh, no, it isn't. And this is a very good example of the fact that we don't really know what's happening. So that's a big project on electron-induced uh, deposition, uh, FEBIB deposition. Um, it's, it's funded by the European Union through a training program called ELENA. Uh, I can send you links if you want to look more up, up about it. It's about 15 uh, postgrads and postdocs working on it at the moment, looking at those type of problems. Um, and we're really finding out the, 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 the difficulties in trying to, to understand it before we can go to a commercial system. Next, I'll turn to radiation damage of DNA. Uh, again, you, you, you all probably know a little about this. You've heard talks, I'm sure, before. We fire in an ion beam, we fire in a radiation beam um, into, the, into the cells, uh, into, the, into the body. Uh, we produce two types of damage, what we call direct damage, where the, the, the radiation hits the, um, the DNA directly, and indirect damage where we produce either secondary electrons or maybe OH radicals from breaking up the water and they react with the DNA. And we have this figure which is roughly about a third and two thirds. The main thing is if you do this you always end up with lots of secondary electrons and the question is can those secondary electrons damage DNA? If you fire one MeV electrons into a cell you produce a secondary electron distribution looking something like that. Um, and you can then look at the, the number of events, the damage you can get is a function of energy. Uh, most of the energy is deposited in, it, it's about a few tens of EVs, so most of the energy you're putting in is low energy, um, and it produces strand breaks. And you have the typical DNA strand breaks, you start with a supercoil DNA and you break it up and you either get a double strand break where you've broken twice, or you get a single strand break. Uh, you can measure these by um, electrophoresis. You can measure the yields you've got. Anybody knew that, but the paper that really still stands out and probably is one of the most cited papers in electrons, if not the most cited paper in electrons in the last 50 years, is the one by uh, Leon Sange, uh, the famous 2000 paper, uh, where you looked at uh, strand breaks by low energy electrons. Uh, it's a subliminal paper. It's, it's, it's led to an entire industry 
huge number of experiments, huge number of projects around the world, it still really hasn't been repeated uh, independently. There was a, another group in America that, that did repeat it, uh, Tom Orlando, but he used the same apparatus and the same methods as Leon. So they basically, they were the same group. In India, SVK um, did do this, and he's the only one I think who's really actually got some data that, that, that follows up on what Leon did. So it's very interesting that we, we've built a whole industry around these, these pictures, these pictures of these resonances induced uh, in single and double strand breaks, but we really haven't repeated it, and we still need to. But they are very, very hard experiments, which is why nobody does it. But we do need to do it. Okay. And as I say, this, I would, I would say at least 250 papers, but I would say probably now much more than that. We've had a whole series of programs in Europe funded around this. Um, these are just five of them. Um, absolutely core to a lot of the work that we've been doing. So the principle is the electron comes in to one of the molecules um, and, and uh, in, in, the, in the DNA, uh, like thymine, uh, collides with it. It's the system of electron attachment process. It, it breaks up the molecule and you get a whole series of fragments. We use this uh, terminology, uh, which is, which again, I guess <coughs> most of you are familiar with, but it confuses our clinical colleagues forever because they see thymine dash H. They think that's thymine with an extra hydrogen bond. Of course, we don't mean that. We mean thymine that's lost a hydrogen, T minus H, and the hydrogen has come out, and the next one means the thymine has lost two hydrogens. Never underestimate. Um, we come up with a nomenclature and other people in the world don't understand it. But we've done these experiments. These are the, some classic ones from Paul Shire, but, but they show the example and there are hundreds of experiments that show other molecules do the same. The electron comes in, forms the negative ion, the hydrogen is normally thrown out. And indeed for nearly all hydrocarbon species, this is what generally happens in dissociative electron attachment. You throw away hydrogens. It doesn't really matter what the molecule is. We see this process in atmospheric chemistry, in Titan, we see this in uh, plasmas, we see this in biological molecules. Of course, we actually obviously, you often want to know which more hydrogen you've lost. So in thymine, you've got several sites, you could lose it from several sites. You'd actually want to know which one it's coming from. Um, you do that by labeling. You have to go and work with your chemistry colleagues, synthetic chemists and you deuterate the molecule and you put a deuterium in each of these species and you see where it comes off. But basically that spectrum that you see there uh, has lots of wiggles in it. And again, originally I think people thought, oh, it's just a little bit of noise. Of course, it's not noise. These are actually, each of those wiggles does actually tell you something. It tells you where hydrogen is coming out from one of these sites. But it also means that you can do site selectivity. It means that you can... Uh, put a, a, a species onto one of these molecules and think that that's where the chemical bond is going to break. So you can actually then control where you break the molecule with your low energy electrons. And that's important for, um, for, for biology. I won't go into all the details, but I'd say just to show that depending on which molecule you put in, you will get a different spectrum, which will depend upon the dissociation dynamics. And you can work out where you want to break the molecule. So you can build it up. And that occurs in not only in these small molecules, it occurs in bigger and bigger, larger biological molecules. We've seen it in oglimers, and it doesn't occur only in the gas phase. We've seen it in the condensed phase. You can do exactly the same experiments. So we know it works in the gas phase. We know it works in the solid phase. Therefore, it probably works in the liquid phase, which is where biology really is, but we haven't done many experiments in liquids. We desperately need experiments on electron-induced liquids, something uh, Nandi and I have talked about. It is the experiment I want to do before I die. I really do want to do electrons in liquids. We've never, I did try to do some of the early experiments uh, with metastable helium atoms back in the 1990s. We have to do some work on liquid jets because that's where the biology is and it will be different, but we just don't know how. Okay. The real reason why this became very popular was that people want radio sensitizers. They want to put drugs into the body that when we irradiate will enhance the dissociation rate and enhance the killing of the uh, cancers. So the question was, these radio sensitizers that have been used for decades often had halogens in them. They were things like bromouracil. We know if we fire electrons at these molecules, by dissociative electron attachment, it likes to go to bromine, it likes to increase it, it likes to do more damage. Is that therefore why bromouracil is good for cancer therapy? 
you can make the measurements. They were done by Ellen Oyenberger 20 years ago. Um, and they show big cross sections, basically. So we want that. The grand challenges now are not are to go further than that. What, what we really need to do is, is to say, okay, we understand something about what's going on. But let's look at the different types of radiation damage that we can get induced by different types of radiation. Exactly the same as in the astrochemistry. You know, what does ion beams do? What do photon beams do? What do doubly charged ions do? What do singly charged ions do? Uh, we don't know. Is it all linked just to the electron induced or not? We need to look at other molecules than DNA. We, we can't, do, the, the cell is not just made up of DNA. What about all the, the lipid materials in the membrane? We don't know much about that. We started to do some work, but not enough. If we can't do it, we can't model radiation therapy. This is a classic picture by Andre Soloviev of trying to build a model of radiation induced damage from the basic principles through to actually trying to work out how many strand breaks there are and therefore how much damage, how many cells you will kill. So starting from atomic and molecular physics, build a model that will predict how many cell, cancer cells you will kill, because that's what you need to do if you're going to do a, a post-on therapy center or a center. You actually want to predict what the damage is going to be, the likelihood of killing off the cell. But you'll see again, absolutely core to that is the basic electron, atomic and molecular physics, particularly the electron collision system. So there are two ways to work at the moment. The one on the left is ion beam therapy. Uh, we started to get clinical ion beams now in Europe. Uh, Heidelberg is now treating people with these ion beam therapies. There are other ones coming in to Europe, Javier Marburg. We are firing in carbon ions to, to kill off the tumors. That's still happening. However, we have some problems. The models which we used for that treatment planning are now being run. There is evidence that those models are wrong. Therefore, the dose that is given to the patient is wrong. And it comes back to not understanding some of the basic uh, electron and atomic and molecular physics related to the Bragg peak. So it's serious. You know, I always used to say getting a cross, if you didn't know a cross section, it wouldn't kill anybody. Well, that's not true in radiation therapy. The cross section's wrong, the dose is wrong, you can kill people, either by having too small a dose or too big a dose. But people are trying to think what the new radio sensitizers should be and they want to couple together with nanoparticles, nanostructure, nanoparticles can get into the cell, they can get into the body. So we're working particularly with these ones, gold-plated nanoparticles. Um, the picture on the bottom right there is gold-plated nanoparticles in a cell. We get them in, they are uptaken into your body. If we can get them into the cancer cells, if we can put things on them which a cancer cell will preferentially absorb, we then radiate them. What is the role of secondary electrons? How many secondary electrons come off from these nanoparticles when they get irradiated by the, by the proton beam or the ion beam? That's what we're working on. We're looking at that. And then how do those electrons, as they come out from the gold nanoparticle, interact with the things on the surface of a nanoparticle, which might be, and then how do they interact with the things in the cell? So what's the energy distribution, secondary energy distribution of particles coming off? The reason people are excited is, 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 is this that what you have here is um, basically um, a radio sensitizers, the tumor volume. Um, on, if you only put gold in um, and, uh, no, and no radiation, um, you get the curves on the top left, on the, on the left. If you have a gold nanoparticle and you irradiate it, you get the uh, graph on the right. And you can see there that the tumor volume, it grows a lot s slower if you've got the nanoparticles in there that you're doing the radiation process. So this is, this is a classic experiment that was done and that's what everybody got really excited into it. If you do gold and irradiation, you can actually kill the cell, kill the radiation tumor. So this is what we're doing now. This is work with Ilko Bold in Berlin. He's trying to come up with new ways to study this process. He's building DNA structures. They're called DNA origamis. Um, he plucks at gold nanostructures in a solution. He gets them onto these, gold, these DNA origamis. And then he can look at the damage induced on these DNA structures using AFM. So we're bringing together a whole variety of suite of information, but he can use electron beams to irradiate these structures and have a look. So I'm coming to the end, uh, and I wanted just to, to give you two new challenges, uh, which are the areas that, that, that we are starting in Europe. The first one is on this one, flames. Now, Everybody knows about flames. Um, flames are um, very rich science. You can bo get books on it. What those books won't tell you much is about the atomic and molecular physics in the flames. 
But what we've known for 20, 30 years is how do you put out a fire? Well, you can get rid of the oxygen, that's good, but not so good if you're in an aircraft where the only way to put out the fire on the aircraft is take all the oxygen out. You save the plane, but you've killed all the passengers, so that's not very good. The other way you can get rid of, put flames out, is remove electrons. So if you, get a, if you have a flame and you suck the, put an electric field across them and suck the electrons out of the flame, it goes out. Um, you also know that, that flames are chemical factories, they produce a lot of dust and soot. Um, so flame retardants uh, go back a long way. And this is a classic paper produced by the American military, um, per courtesy of somebody who will know Brian Mitchell, who, who actually worked on this uh, famous force of doing um, dissociative electron attachment and experiments and so on. Uh, but uh, this is basically saying that there are certain flame retardants that you can put in, certain gases that you put in, that if you put them into, spray them on a flame, they will go out. And the way they work is they're electron sponges. So these, these species, SF6, CF3Br, CH3I, they all pull out electrons. So if you use these as your flame, re your, your fire extinguisher, they, you don't need very much of it, low concentration, you put them in, the electrons disappear, and the flame goes out. But you don't kill the people, you don't do anything with the oxygen, except for as low. Now the problem is these are used, these are used predominantly in aircraft, they're used in military vehicles and so on. But they're all, most of those species are global warming gases. So they're bad, you're not supposed to have them anymore. At the bottom there, you'll find two other molecules, FeCO5. Now, if you think we've, where have I seen that before? That is because that is one of the classic molecules we're using for FEBIP, focused electron reinduced deposition, to build iron structures to make small magnetic surface structures. But it's also a flame retardant. And TiCi4 is another one, oh, so actually Cl4, sorry. Is another one. So what we're trying to do now is, is bring together the people across Europe who are interested in flames and, and technology and then you're also interested in about the formation of the soot because a lot of that soot is negatively charged therefore it is electron induced processing and we want to understand how those things and this all comes back to those clusters I mentioned before those large structures that the flame is full of molecules which are or dimers, trimers, or even bigger. Often they are linked together with water, but they drive the processing of making the soot. If I want to have flames that generate heat, but not so much soot, I need to understand how the soot is made. Maybe I can change, if I understand the electron chemistry, I can reduce the amount of soot being produced, etc. So that's what we're looking at at the moment. We were supposed to have our first meeting on that um, in May. It was all being postponed because of COVID. So now it's not gonna happen until 2021. At least we hope it's gonna be in 2021. We haven't got a date set for you. The last thing I wanted to mention was space travel. Um, as, as, as Chetan said, I do a lot of my work now in planetary science. Um, we want to send things out into space, but the problem sending things out into space is um, it's expensive. And it's expensive because we have to use a lot of rocket fuel. And rocket fuel is heavy and it's expensive. So what we would like to do instead is to send something up there which is, which is a lot lighter and a lot cheaper. Now you can do that by using uh, what they call iron-induced thrusters. So basically what you do um, is you, you let's see the next picture. Sorry, go ahead. So you make a plasma and the plasma, when you in initiate the plasma, puts a very slow um, thrust on your instrument. So it, it, it has a continuous um, acceleration but very slowly and the molecules that the molecule that's predominantly been used up until now is xenon um, because um, it works the other one which people want to use sorry is iodine iodine is good because it sublimes i should have put iodine in there uh, iodine is good because you set it up as a solid and it, it, and it sublimes to go into the gas and then you ionize the gas so um, there's a lot of work going on now about trying to develop this thruster technology, most particularly for these things, CubeSats and NanoSats. It will work particularly well for small, lightweight craft. You don't need much 
because of the weight of these things, nanosats are very small, you can build them in your own undergraduate laboratories essentially. You can imagine as that's small and lightweight, you don't need much, en much uh, energy to, to redirect them, so to, to or change their orientation to, 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 to that. So this is where this thrust of technology comes in. What gases would we use as the uh, generation of this uh, type of thing? And we could just initiate a plasma, we can initiate a thrust of technology, we can redirect. So we can have a whole array of these CubeSats and NanoSats out there. What we'd love to do in the next space mission <clears throat> is actually do that, is actually launch our space mission, but parallel with the space mission, um, have two or three of these uh, NanoSats associated with it that will decouple from it that we can use in an architecture maybe linked together by clever computing technology to, to act as an array. But these things are much cheaper. But we need to understand the, 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 the cluster technology. So we're working on that with the UK companies. The UK has putting quite a lot of money into the space industry and it's going to have a spaceport. Um, we haven't reached, we're going to even be able to launch our own satellites, something we haven't been able to do since the 1960s. I know India has been launching lots of satellites. I think you still have the record for the most satellites launched in one mission, which is something like 110 um, from your, your, your base down in the south. Um, but the UK is aiming to launch its own ones and this cluster technology is one of the things that we're working with to do some trial technologies with. And again, we need to understand atomic and molecular physics. Um, the first thing is iodine. Just go away and try and look at the database for electron impact experiments with iodine and try and work, find data on the cross sections for electron induced iodine experiments. You won't find many. You try calculating it, even with quantum. Okay, so conclusions. Electrons are universal. Electrons control many processes. Electrons can induce chemistry. All these things are critical, but to understand them all, we need lots of data and we need to be able to do lots of models, which in turn needs lots of data. The applications range from atmospheric science, terrestrial atmospheres, increasingly extraterrestrial atmospheres. We're going to Jupiter. Jupiter's got nice big aurora. We would like to be able to look at the same model of Jupiter aurora in the same way as we measure the Earth's aurora. Industry, anything to do with plasmas, we need to understand electrons. Atmospheric pressure plasmas means we need to understand clusters. We've got new technologies like FEBID, focused electron beam induced deposition much more complicated than we think, very different chemistry between irradiating molecules on a surface and irradiating the molecules landing on the surface, so a mixture of gas and solid phase. Health, radiation damage, radiotherapy, nanoparticles, ion beam therapy, nanoparticle clinical therapy. If we get it wrong, as we may have done in some of the models, data may not have been good enough, you can get the dose wrong. If you get the dose wrong, you either give the patient too little, so the cancer grows, you give them too much, you might have other nasty effects. Atomic and molecular physics is important, but it's got to be accurate. And finally, I've given you two new things, understanding combustion, understanding new ways of putting flames out, not using water, not removing the oxygen, maybe also being able to control how the, the amount of soot and so on you have in flames, what leads to that soot formation process. And finally, for all of us who really would like to go and be Star Trek and explore the universe, new types of thruster technology, not using large amounts of rocket fuel, actually using molecules which can be dissociated, make a plasma and do this thruster technology. I'll finish by, by listing all the people who have worked with me for many, many years, 30 plus years. First of all at UCL, then at the OU, now at Kent. Many of them you will know. There's Barla there as an undergraduate student in the top picture, or sorry, postgraduate student in the top picture. You haven't changed that much, Barla. It's very worrying. Um, you're keeping young, that's good. Um, these are just some of the people I've collaborated with over the years, all countries. If we look at the bottom of that list, you will see obviously the key people here in India. Uh, the group, uh, Josipur, Minashki and Chetan, I'm sorry I didn't put down all your individual colleges because I can't remember them and they weren't put in the slide, but it was all that linked with Sadar Patel. Uh, Krishna Kumar and all his colleagues at TIFR, I should list all the other ones as well over the years, Sadiq Rangwala and so on, VP, etc. But that collaboration with, with, with EK has been a marvellous collaboration um, and probably one of the happiest times of my life was to have EK over in our lab for two years. Um, wonderful times and uh, we've produced some really top ranking experiments, some of which we still don't understand, the, the sensitive electro-attachment to DEA for example. Um, 
Raja, also having the time to talk about some of the stuff on UV synchrotrons. Bobby Anthony, again, known him since he was an undergraduate student, now leading his group and developing nice things there. I could put down Nandi and many others as well. And of course, Bala, who I won't say we speak daily, but it's, it's nearly daily. Um, and at the moment are producing now a whole series of fascinating experiments on shockwaves. And these are just some of the numerous projects that have funded the data that I've shown you today. So I hope that was useful. Um, we have come up to the hour. I, I will be happy to take any questions or comments. Um, it's a bit of a wild, wild, wild tour. I, I would have liked to have cut down the slides a bit, but I'd say um, yesterday, I unfortunately, disappeared for other reasons. So I didn't have a chance to uh, tidy it up, but um, I hope that still was, was useful for everybody. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nigel. This is Viber. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, such a nice talk. I request uh, if there are any questions, please put up your names on your chat and I will call out your name and then you can ask the question. No questions. I'm no surprised. questions. Yeah, that's very <laughs> surprised, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. The, so in the meantime, I will ask you something. No, Shiva uh, has a question. Uh, oh yeah, Shiva Raman has a question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Shiva. Oh, sorry, I was a bit delayed in typing that up. Uh, thank you, Professor Mason, for a very nice talk. It really sort of expanded our horizons when it comes to uh, electron impact studies. I have a very particular uh, question that. You mentioned about uh, liquids, uh, electrons yeah. interacting with liquids. Uh, there has been quite a bit of work actually in the photon community. Uh, and definitely there are uh, surprises uh, that people have seen there. And even now uh, they do. Maybe even one of our colleagues from India, Bhargavram, he probably worked on it recently. My question is, what, what, what do you think would uh, make it very interesting to do electron impact studies uh, with liquid jets, especially water and uh, so on. Well, water is a horrible liquid to work with. Um, there was a there was there was a classic set of experiments by a person called Manfred Feubel, who I had the fortunate time to spend some time with in the 1990s at Göttingen, who built a liquid water beam apparatus. Uh, water is horrible. Uh, the main problem with liquids is that you have vapor pressure from the liquid. So if you try and pass electrons or ions or photons um, into the liquid. It has to go through this uh, surface uh, layer of, of vapor and water is terrible uh, because there's loads of vapor above the liquid. Um, there are tricks that you can do. You can put in cesium iodide which, which seems to reduce the vapor pressure of the liquid. That was something Manfred showed some time ago. Um, the, 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 the probably the molecules that we want to look at are, are biological molecules. So, so molecules that sort of you know we know in our body and our cells are in a kind of liquid form. Now there was a period of time where people did these experiments. A um, few people around the world, and again, a long time ago in the 1980s, they, they predominantly were doing XPS studies. Um, in the UK, it was done at Sussex, um, but some of the other places, they looked at things basically with low vapor pressure compounds like squalene oils you get from vacuum pumps, um, because they could actually assume that this vapor layer didn't happen. What we're really interested in really is the experiments that people did um, where they tried to put mixtures together in liquid and they saw how the liquid separates out. So there's a whole industry of surfactants, of molecules that like to sit on the surface of liquid. This is what you need for washing powders and other stuff. But this also happens in biology. And then you start to think about how the molecules are aligned on the surface of the liquid and whether the alignment determines, you know, what chemistry and what reactions occur. Now all these things have been looked, you know, have been discussed. Um, but there hasn't been a coherent and consistent approach um, to, to studying these. And we're trying to extrapolate. The, all the DNA work by uh, Pimblot and so on in the States basically takes either gas or solid stage and says, well, in a cell, we'll make a few correction factors for the liquid. But the, the, the molecules in the liquid may well, don't, you know, they, they may well be in um, uh, through Van der Waals, they may be in small mini, mini clusters, if you like. Uh, they're, they're not independent. So why should the chemistry and the cross-sections be the same? But we've been discussing this 
you know, uh, with Professor Joshua Poor, I remember back in about 1997, 1998, of whether we could actually use his, his uh, the techniques that he was using for calculating ionization cross sections, the techniques that Chet Enum and Ashke and Bobby and many others have used. Uh, could we adapt them to liquids? You know, could, could we think about how we would do this in a liquid phase? And we talked about it. Um, but we haven't got any experiments to test it, so we can come up with an answer, but we don't know if it's true. So, there's a, so basically, there's a lot of different experiments. And I think really what I would like to do, and I have talked to some colleagues in India about developing an experiment, where basically you make a liquid jet and you fire your electrons at that liquid jet. I did that in the 1990s uh, with a person called Morgan, uh, Howard Morgner, um, uh, in, and where we actually didn't fire electrons, we fired metastable atoms because his expertise is metastable helium atoms and penning ionization. And we got some interesting results. Uh, we never really went back to it. And I think we have to, you know, next generation, we can't, we can't af assume that there's one state of matter, the liquid, and we don't understand it. We also need to know a lot more about electrons moving through liquids, to be honest. But you're right, there are photon experiments. Being done. If, if Viber permits me, can I ask a sh very short follow up question? Yeah, sure. Um, Go ahead. Of course, th these liquid jets are messy, as you said, but uh, we can, of course, make uh, clusters of, say, water, uh, water molecules, and possibly even host some um, uh, biologically important molecules. Uh, perhaps. Absolutely. Can, uh, and my colleague. Uh, yeah. Yeah, my yeah. colleague Sam yeah. Eden um, started this, and again, uh, again, many, many of you know Sam. Um, he he started a project um, ooh, I don't know, more years ago, and I probably want to think about where he did exactly that. He he talked about bridging the gap, and the idea was that to get from a gaseous state to a solid state, you would you would basically go through the clustering. You, you would build up your clusters and you'll see how the chemistry and the physics changed in the clusters. And this led to people like uh, Elena Gorfinkel at the OU, working with, again, colleagues, I think, in Canada, to, to develop um, electron scattering from clusters, multiple scattering approximations, et cetera, trying to use um, our matrix to do that. And that was the idea, that you would build that up. And, and, but the problem is, Dealing with clusters, you often need to separate out the clusters. You need, you, you, you know, you just get a, a, an amorphous mixture of the clusters. You don't know what have control over how many monomers, how many dimers, and so on you've got. So Sam has been working on using uh, stark deflecting techniques, um, something that uh, Gert Meyer developed um, to try and make a beam of clusters of molecules with slightly different dipole moments and separate them out so that you can look at electrons on a dimer and a trimo and everything else, proven much, much harder to do than, than we thought five or six years ago. We still haven't done it. It isn't quite operational. But okay. Right. Uh, Thank you. Okay. So Danoj has yeah. a question. Danoj, yeah. please ask. Yes. Uh, uh, am, am I audible, Professor Mason? Yes. Am I audible? Yeah. 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 Yeah, uh, I have a general question, like we can, we can clearly see that the electron scattering or collision has a lot of importance in various atmospheres. Uh, but what about ion scattering with atoms and molecules? Is it equally important in these various environments, ion scattering or ion uh, collision? Yes, I mean, our ion atom physics, ion molecule physics is, is, is obviously equally uh, important. Uh, again, you've got some of the experts there. I am seeing Lokash nodding furiously there. I'm sure you can nod harder. Um, Absolutely. Um, ion atom ion molecule interactions are also very important. Um, we're finding that now um, in the astrochemistry. Uh, we, 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 we're particularly interested at the moment, our current interest is sulfur ions because we are going to go to Europa, uh, we're going to go to uh, the Jovian moons. They are, go they are bombarded by sulfur ions from Io, um, the volcanic moon of the Jovian system. We want to understand uh, sulfur ion implantation, sulfur ion chemistry. Now, in the last two weeks, we have been going back to that simple system. We try and use a simple system which we can cross compare. We use pure methanol ice and we look at CO2 water ice. There are two standard systems. We have just got the uh, Tandetron to make it a good source. Uh, we're talking about, um, you know, uh, hundreds of nanoamps. Uh, microamps uh, of uh, ions, uh, so we, uh, 
get good doses um, of sulfur two plus. Mm -hmm. The reaction chemistry is at least 10 times faster for the sulfur ion than the photon. So okay. now, we've tried to talk to people about doing calculations on ion atom molecules. They can do them, of course they can, but, they, but I want them in the solid phase. I don't want them in the gas phase, I want them in the solid phase. And they all go, hmm, that's a bit more difficult. <laughs> so I want to know why we're seeing this, this, this very rapid change in reaction rate when the molecules, when the ion beams are coming in. We have to calculate uh, stopping powers, we have to calculate uh, energy distributions, secondary electron distributions. Um, but yeah, so at the moment they're absolutely vital, uh, but there are many people who are prepared to volunteer to make me do me some calculations of ion atom and ion molecule interactions in the solid phase. Solid phase, okay. Yeah, that will, but be, that will important. be vital okay. because we, we have got to understand what molecules we're going to make and what concentrations we're going to make by, um, the, by the uh, IO irradiation of these moons. Because what's the point of trying to build a spectrometer to go and measure them if we don't know what sort of concentrations we might be looking for? How deep do they penetrate into the surface? Do they come off again? Are they going to be in the plumes? Are they going to be in the plumes coming out of some of these things? Uh, what's the desorption? How long do they last? These are all questions we're trying to do on the new... Um, so Tom Key in Debrechen, if you don't know a Tom Key, um, it's, it's, the, it's an accelerator facility. They've had a big investment. They've got a brand new Tenditron. They've got lots of other accelerators. We happen to be using that. We are actually moving an ECR source over, we're moving experiment over there to join the ECR source. Um, most of you will know that Belfast had a very strong um, iron physics group. They've all now retired effectively. But we've built up a lovely ice chamber there. Um, We've now literally going to move that over to, to the Gretchen. We're going to put it onto the ECR source there. Uh, Bob McCulloch, who many of you will know, he's actually, he built it. He's going to help us reassemble it. It should have gone in April. Um, it can't because of COVID, so we're going to move it in September. So, yeah, if, and, and you can, if any of you want to go and work on that facil those facilities, you can because they're members of the Europlanet um, project, and you can apply for time to go and use it. The first seven projects were approved last week. Uh -huh. So yeah, awesome. ion molecule actions are very important. They're even more important for what I want in the solid phase. If anybody's prepared to give me some nice calculations, even if they're um, rough approximations, uh, <laughs> semi-empirical measurements of what I can calculate in a surface, I would be very grateful. Okay, thank you so Next. much. Okay, any other question? Yeah, so uh, Nigel, I, I was actually wondering about the surface versus the bulk uh, interaction of electrons in liquid phase. Mm -hmm. Because uh, even most of the solid phase also, when you are interacting with low energy electrons, most of the interactions are going to be on the surface. Because as the electron is going to get into the surface, it's going to have a lot of loss of energy as well as uh, charging. So, uh, but then you have more or less answered the question that you are interested in those kind of uh, surface uh, phenomena and particularly orientation of various molecules on the surface and how it affects the, the chemistry. Yeah, depth is important. Um, it's, it's particularly important in comets. Um, the ice layer may not be very thick. Um, one of the things we've been looking at um, is to, to do layered ices. So uh, we haven't done so much of those electrons yet. We just start, well, we have actually now. The, 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 the woman who's just finished her PhD thesis did some of this. So we've been looking at a very simple system, benzene and water, mm -hmm. um, oil and water, do they mix? So what we've been doing is we've been looking at um, a mixed ice of benzene and water co-deposited together. We've been looking at benzene on top of water and water on top of benzene. Um, and then we've been doing both ultraviolet experiments where the UV light doesn't penetrate very deep. Um, so it's basically a surface phenomenon. And then electron irradiation where the electrons can get through the top layer uh, into the depth of the bottom layer. We produce some reaction in the bottom layer and then those radicals could they become up onto the top layer. So we're, that's why we're trying to do these layering experiments to see how the chemistry goes. And then we compare that with the mixture you know, just, just put them together and to see. And you won't be surprised uh, to say, to know that those are giving us very different results. 
Um, and that's an interesting thing about you know how, how it's working. Um, so there is a there is a view that about some of this astrochemistry stuff that that your ice you should think of it more as an onion with with layer on top of a layer on top of a layer, and you haven't got a sort of nice the mixed thing. You've got a kind of onion layers. So when you will radiate it and how deep you go into it is different. So just compare sulfur ions and photons. Just think about the, the range and the stopping potential for those two. You can do a shrim trim calculation. We've been got some interesting results we don't quite understand where the ion beam goes in. It goes through the ice and then it, it stops at the interface between the ice and the substrate. So something interesting happens there compared to whether most of the energy passes right the way through the ice and deposits in the substrate. Compared to top, when we have, a, we haven't really been able to do with ion beams, it's quite hard to just, just do the surface. We'd have to do that on the ECR, the lower energy force. So layering is also important. Yeah. And again, the reason for doing that on icy moons is you've got your ice, which is sat there, and then some material comes up in one of these plumes, it comes up, and it settles back down. So you've got this layer on top with maybe a big different layer underneath. And that's again something which, which for Europa and so on might well be happening. And we want to understand if you're going to make different molecules from that, because again, we can try and look for those when we go out there. And maybe the, the holy grail is always to try and find a molecular species that tells you, ah, oh, if you see this, it can only have come from this chemical or physical process. It's a, it's a, it's a marker for a particular process. Um, maybe we'll find some. Okay. Uh, Dhananjay has a question. Dhananjay, please go. Let's go ahead. Please ask. Nandi, you're going to tell yeah. me you've built a water system and everything is fine. I have not started. I have started. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I have written a project, but that is not successful uh, because of the huge fund uh, is required. And uh, the, my question is that uh, when we uh, work with this electron beam and uh, we look for the ions, but in this, in the case of the liquid jet, people have already uh, demonstrated that uh, they can use this kind of photon and then. Uh, they can look for this kind of photoelectron spectroscopy and uh, do the many things. But I, my, my uh, worry is that part of the challenges uh, to do this kind of uh, the same experiment with the electron beam and how to how to uh, overcome these challenges. Yeah, well, I mean, as I say, the liquids that, that we want to probably look at is not nice things like water. They'll probably be uh, peptides and things well, or oils, these squalines and so on. Um, and you can measure the energy, uh, the energy loss spectrum um, as the, that way. Um, or you could just put infrared radiation through and see what you make. Okay. But no, liquid, liquid experiments are difficult. That's, that's, that's why people haven't done them. I mean, they're very easy, people would have done them, wouldn't they? There is some nice work. Um, I think Nandy, we, we shared the papers with you. Um, Michael Allen. If, if, if you want some, if you want to do a clever experiment, always go and look and see what Michael Allen did because he probably has done it, and it will be better than you experiment that you do. But right at the end of Michael Allen, that's before he retired in from Freiburg, he did some work on on iron, uh, ionic liquids with uh, UI Fedor. UI Fedor, yes, UI Fedor is now at Prague um, on iron liquids. Um, and that was some quite interesting experiments, and I think that, that I know you is trying to follow those up now in his position in Prague. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, then let us all thank uh, Nigel for very nice and uh, informative talk. And buy the books. <laughs> Shamelessly, uh, buy, the, buy the two books uh, yeah. <laughs> or get them online or whatever um, because most of the stuff I've shown you today has come from them and they, but they give you a bit more but more importantly um, they were both written to have very large references so at the moment those references are up, up to date from about well 2019 the books came out in 1819 so they're up to date by the end of 2018 so um so if you do want to go in, they're as up to date as that. Obviously, the field moves on, and they will soon become out of date. But at the moment, they're there. Uh, and as I say, in, in, in the one edited by Odor, 
there are lots of other people. There's a very good, uh, Hermain has written an article on our matrix methodology and how that's going. Um, Petrus Frederick's written a very nice chapter on um, looking at uh, dissociative electron attachment in icy surfaces and showing that molecules are made by DEA um, by actually monitoring the yields of function of energy in, in the ice. Um, so there's some, there's some really, and as I said, David Field and I wrote an article on trying to calculate the number of electrons there are in space, which is great fun to try and actually calculate some real numbers. And um, well, our astronomy colleagues, we did send it out to our astronomy colleagues to make sure we didn't talk complete rubbish. And they told us, they, they didn't say, you know, that what we were talking about was, 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 was completely off scale, but it's, it's, it, it gives you some idea of numbers and importance. Okay, so with that note, uh, let's thank Nigel again and let's call this uh, colloquium closed and I also invite you all for the next colloquium which will be uh, announced by uh, CP. The next colloquium is not the next Friday but the Friday after that. So that happens to be, where is my calendar, the dates?